Our first reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 6. And that can be found on 895, 896 in the Pew Bibles. So we are always confident, even though we know that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident, and we would rather be away from those earthly bodies, for then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Holy Gospel, according to Mark, chapter 4, beginning at verse 26, and that's on page 763, 764. Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First a leaf blade pushes through, then the heads of wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a a sickle, for the harvest time has come. Jesus said, how can I describe the kingdom of God? What story should I use to illustrate it? It is like a mustard seed planted in the ground, It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows long branches and birds can make nests in its shade. Jesus used similar stories and illustrations to teach the people as much as they could understand. In fact, in his public ministry, he never taught without using parables. But afterward, when he was alone with his disciples, he explained everything to them. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ the Word. I stand before you and I speak in the wonderful, glorious name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I have a really, really good friend who's a deacon, and she ministers in the outskirts, rural outskirts of one of of our cities, preparing and journeying towards priesthood. So New Year's Eve, a couple of years ago, she got invited to a New Year's party to see the year in. And she couldn't find anything special to wear. So she decided to turn up in her clerical collar. As we all know, these party goers, they turn up as cats and pirates and Arab sheiks. But she came as she was, a deacon. Like the other people there, she was young, spoke the same language, but they didn't believe that she was actually a deacon. And several of them came up to her and said, they didn't believe in God, so why the collar? And many others echoed that sentiment, and she knew that she was in a different environment. She was away from her usual church work amongst church people. 
But as she talked with these 20-somethings, 30-somethings, Generation Xs, Millennials, she came to realize that what they were looking for and what they wanted was authenticity in the place of authority. They were isolated. Many of them had come from broken homes and they yearned for some sort of commitment, some sort of belonging in a caring community. And she also came to understand by the end of the evening that those who had approached her and called themselves atheists were actually not. They turned out in conversation to just hold a deep resentment for the church. In fact, what they seemed not to understand what that they, was that they really, really needed a closer relationship with Jesus. And this lovely deacon friend of mine said what we as a church all need to be aware of that a whole generation of children, of younger people needed to be reached again with unpretension and authenticity. They needed to be reached with a message and the presence of Jesus Christ. New Year parties, eh? God's kingdom it grows in mysterious but miraculous ways. Ancient people, they knew nothing about the power which transformed a seed into a plant and a shoot into one with a full ear of grain. They had no time-lapse photography, but they did have an awe of the place of, in nature that God stood in. The farmer would sow the seed and then wait. The rains would come and the farmer would get up night and day and watch that growth. And then when the harvest time came, he would reap what he, would, what he had sown. Yes, the farmer sowed and reaped it. But he would also give thanks for God's work, God who gives us growth. And it was this image that Jesus used to speak to us, 11 sharp, about growth of this church and of his people. God's kingdom comes as a small seed, as small as a mustard seed. But when planted and tended, would grow into the greatest of trees and produce grain enough to be harvested. This reality, as Jesus describes it in our gospel parable of the growing seed, is that there is, there is dynamism within us, a spirit moving within us. We just need to acknowledge it. Every one of us here has been seeded and something is growing within us. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we don't believe it. Sometimes we don't trust it. But it's there. Sometimes we wait years, hoping, looking, wondering when, and then one day we see the first green blade rise up. Other times we just happen to wake up one morning and are surprised by what's changed in us. How did that happen? When did it happen? I don't know. But Jesus tells us today that it's always been there. This parable, 
Jesus tells us not so much about gardening and farming, and you all know how hopeless I am in those areas, but he is using images from gardening, from farming, to talk about your life and mine. He uses them as a metaphor for the way God works in our lives. And he uses it as an encouragement and to offer hope. Our lives are like a garden that has been planted with seed. You know how that works. It takes time. A lot happens underground, hidden within the soils of our hearts. And there's a lot of waiting. And then one day something sprouts up and begins to grow. First the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. We are always in the process of growing into completion. Jesus said, it's as if someone would scatter seed on the ground, which makes me wonder, who is that someone in your life? Who has scattered seeds in the ground of your life? And what were those seeds? Who are the people who have loved and encouraged you, offered wisdom and guidance in your life, spoke difficult truths that changed your life? Who are the ones that gave you hope, stood by you, helped you find yourself? Those are the seeds scattered in your life by someone. And what if you and I were to be the seed scatterers for the life of the world? When have we put the interests of others ahead of ourselves? Who have we encouraged, loved, reached out to in compassion? When have we sat with someone who's grieving and just simply said, I'm here for you? When have we spoken out and worked for justice? What barren ground is waiting to be seeded by us, planted with our lives, our gifts, our passions, our presence. Maybe it's the barren ground of violence, racism, poverty. Maybe it's a barren ground across which migrant people walk in search of new lives. Maybe, just maybe, it's the barren ground of despair loneliness or fear. Maybe even it's a barren ground of grief, pain or heartache. How might we scatter the seeds in those places and a thousand more like them? And as we look within ourselves to the garden and the seeds that God himself has planted in our lives, what do you wish was growing in your garden right now? What colors or fragrances are missing from God's garden? Where have the weeds taken over? And what needs attention? I'm well aware that I've asked you more questions than I have answers for. I have no answers. But what will you do with what you see around you? 
what can 11 Sharp corporatively, individually do in God's garden? Celebrate, give thanks, water, fertilize, prune, pull some weeds, make some changes, yeah. A 14th century Greek monk, Meister Eckhart, says this about the seeds we've been talking about. The seed of God is in us. Given an intelligent and hard-working farmer, it will thrive and grow up to God, whose seed it is. And accordingly, its fruit will be God-natured. Pear seeds grow into pear trees. Nut seeds grow into nut trees. And a God seed, seed, a God seed grows into God. Meister Eckhart. Amen.